All right, good evening, everybody. It looks like our participant numbers are starting to level off, so we'll get started. Welcome to the latest Science Speaker Series Lecture. I'm Sam at the Mariah Mitchell Association, and I'd like to thank you for joining us this evening. Um, I'd first like to thank our sponsors, which are Bank of America, Cape Air, The White Elephant, and Cisco Brewers. And I'll give you all a note about how tonight's program will be run. We do have our Q&A function up and running. We encourage you to send your questions in throughout the talk. Our speaker is going to pause midway and we'll answer some questions then, as well as a dedicated Q&A portion at the end of the talk. So feel free to send those questions in all throughout the evening. Um, and then I'd now like to introduce tonight's speaker, who I'm so excited to introduce, Julia Neisel. Julia is the Coastal Shoreline and Floodplain Manager at the Massachusetts Office of Coastal Zone Management. She leads the Storm Smart Coasts Program, which helps communities proactively address coastal flooding and erosion while enhancing beach systems. She serves on the Massachusetts Emergency Support Function Team to help inform response and recovery from coastal storm events and supports state hazard mitigation and climate adaptation planning and impl implementation. Julia also teaches as an adjunct with the Marine Studies Consortium to help build broader appreciation for coastal resource functions and values. Julia, thank you so much for joining us this evening. I'm really excited to hear your talk. I'm gonna stop sharing my screen and pass it over to you. Great, thank you. I will share my screen and then we'll get rolling. Okay, so you should be seeing my slides now. Great. So thank you for that nice introduction. I'm really happy to join everyone tonight and I'm hopeful that I'll inspire you to help support our coastal storm damage reporting for uh, the state, which informs a number of local efforts. Let me just advance here, here we go. So we have plenty of time this evening to cover some background information on coastal storm damages that we typically see across the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. I'll describe how we use these local reports and also provide an overview of who is typically uh, submitting reports to the system when we're encouraging people to go out and take photographs and submit their observations, and then give you a demo of a tool that we created over 10 years ago to make reporting easy and also standardized so that we can do some long-term data analysis and comparison with the types of uh, storm impacts that we're seeing along the coast as well as high tide events. So let's walk through some of the common coastal storm damages and impacts that we see. The most baseline observation that we have is splashover of coastal structures like seawalls along the shoreline, and then also water splashing over onto our shore roads as well. This is um, sometimes associated with overwash of sandy material on low-lying beaches. You can see here that the splash over carried sand from this low beach and dune system across this road. Sometimes the storm impacts are a little stronger and carry larger grain size material as well. Here's an example of gravel and in some cases cobble overwashing a seawall and onto a road. And in the background there, you can see that emergency management efforts are already underway to clear that material to maintain access in the case of emergency. So these observations are typically associated with the National Weather Service minor coastal flood advisory. I included the definition that the National Weather Service provides here. And I just want to reiterate that the impacts are mostly to low-lying vulnerable roads and its associated infrastructure if there is any. And then also homes, if they do have basements that close to the shoreline, they potentially could see some flooding penetrating into their basements as well. But we're not seeing widespread impacts when we have a minor coastal flood advisory. 
So ramping up with the storm impacts, when we have greater storm surge and wave activity, we can actually see the underlying roadbed get compromised on shore roads, and we can start to see asphalt um, getting compromised, which would prevent someone from traveling the roadway and hinder evacuation and emergency response activities. In unarmored shoreline systems, this moderate category is where we start to see beach material being carried out. So we're seeing lowering of the beach face and then we're also seeing erosion of the dune system or the coastal bank system, depending on what elevated landform you have along your shoreline. If there is a coastal structure such as a seawall present along the shoreline, the loss of sand or other beach material will unfortunately oftentimes expose the footings of the seawall, causing some potentially significant issues in terms of eventual collapse of the wall and then also impacts to utilities that are often um, back behind these walls underlying these roadbeds. In areas, especially along the Cape, we have septic systems that are still on the beach and with significant amount of vertical loss of the beach, we can start to see some of these septic systems being uncovered, which as you can imagine, um, can impact water quality in the area. And then oftentimes we are in a situation where a municipality or a state park will actually need to restrict access out on to the beach just because it isn't safe for um, residents to be out there because of high water or wave energy. In this moderate category, we can also see the surge and waves impacting infrastructure that we have out over the water. This is an example of a dock being damaged during a coastal storm event. Any kind of decking that's out um, off of a house along the shoreline that's um, close to the water can also get impacted during these moderate events as well. So I'm bringing us back to the National Weather Service coastal flooding definitions. And you can see the definition here for moderate coastal flooding. And I've highlighted that this is where we start to see some um, superficial damage to homes along the shoreline in addition to more significant impact to our shore roads. And then if we move up to the major coastal flooding category from the National Weather Service, that's where unfortunately we do see um, compromises of residences and businesses and other structures uh, along the shoreline. So uh, what does that mean for Nantucket? I just grabbed the hydrograph for Nantucket today. And if you look at this, you'll notice surprisingly that you are actually in an action stage today. So you do have some elevated water levels out there today, possibly due to the storm that's coming up the coast that may impact the area over the weekends. And typically with just a foot of surge, um, actually, let me show you that I wanted to show you, if you did wanna visit the Nantucket tide gauge. It's down in Nantucket Harbor by the ferry. And you can actually see the instrumentation in the water that's been taking records since the 1960s, as a little aside. So going back to the hydrograph and focusing on these tide heights, with one foot of surge above what you typically see for a high tide in Nantucket Harbor, you actually get into the minor threshold that the National Weather Service has defined. And then moving up from there with only two and a half feet of surge above what you typically experience gets you into the moderate threshold event. So two and a half feet of surge, you can start to see 
um, travel disruptions down along the harbor in terms of floodwaters and also overwash material being on the road. And then moving up to the major threshold, that's four feet of surge above your typical high tide. And interestingly, since the gauge has been recording data, the record is actually 7.9 feet. And that was experienced back in October of 1991. So if you were out and about in the harbor back in the Halloween timeframe of 1991, um, that is the level of a major event for the Nantucket tide gauge. And bringing us back down to the bottom, I just wanted to point out that there is this action threshold, and this is a foot between up to a foot of surge before you hit the minor threshold. And that's where um, the weather forecast office and coastal managers will start monitoring the forecast closely to determine if there's going to need to be some response activity related to the storm. Now, once we have the data and we can process it and communicate it, it feeds into a lot of different management efforts and activities. The primary reason why we created the tool over a decade ago was to support our emergency response and recovery efforts at the state. After um, Hurricane Bob, we actually formed a coastal storm damage assessment team and they would relay on the ground observations by phone to the state emergency operations center. And paper records were kept over the years until we developed a standardized database and this online and mobile app reporting system. The information is used for situa situational awareness to determine where we're seeing the greatest impacts along the shoreline from the storm and where we need to provide additional support in terms of any kind of um, uh, manpower or physical assets to support the local emergency management efforts. And the information is also used when we have a moderate or major event to help communicate to FEMA the extent of damages and serves as a baseline for seeking funding during a declaration, a disaster declaration. After we've met those kind of baseline requirements for our emergency response and recovery, we've actually over the years had a great working relationship with the National Weather Service, the local forecast offices, and they've been able to use the information to ground truth those surge thresholds for when we see minor, minor moderate, and major impacts. I showed the hydrograph and the um, minor threshold for the island was, is now um, four feet, but it actually used to be five feet about 10 years ago before they had the on the ground information in terms of what those um, flooding thresholds were. So we're pretty excited that the observations were able to support those definitions. Long-term information can also support local planning and also the review of projects to make sure that we're not putting um, people in development in harm's way. And in addition, it can support scientific studies of coastal flooding as well as erosion models as well. Now, in terms of actually getting folks out on the ground and providing the observations. As I mentioned, this effort all started with our emergency response. So for coastal storms, the largest number of reporters are actually people that have been recruited by us within our formal coastal storm damage assessment team. So we recruit um, municipal representatives, state employees, as well as federal employees to provide these reports. 
when we added a King Tide form to our tool, that's when we started to branch out into recruiting local watershed groups and beach teams, as well as folks in academia and other um, members of the community. People often ask, well, when do you want us to go out? And no threshold is too minor for us. We want as much data as we can get. I've highlighted the hazardous weather outlook that the National Weather Service provides. And you can see for today that there's actually a statement about minor coastal flooding possible for this weekend. So this weekend would be a great time to download the tool and test it out. I would love to see um, some new reporters in the system. The one thing um, I do need to caution you about is that when you start to get into the moderate to major events, you do need to make sure that you're being safe. As you can imagine, um, it's easy to get caught off guard in terms of um, waves breaking over structures, carrying overwash material, and there's also oftentimes down power lines once you get into the moderate to major events. And um, you know, those, those threshold events are best reserved for the trained uh, state employees who are um, have a lot of experience with dealing with these events. So again, use caution. <laughs> so Right now, I'm going to take a pause and see if there's any questions before I move into talking in more detail about the tool. I don't see any in the Q&A yet, but I will, this is another plug, anyone submit your questions if you have any. Um, but I have a question for you. Sure. So on the slides, when you were showing us the pictures of specifically the damage to roads and pavement, um, does is it more about the water level or is it a, is the water stronger because of the tide like what would cause that amount of damage it's just a, it's about water levels so it's elevated water level but it's also the waves associated with the storm as well okay if there's nothing else i will proceed with highlighting the tool This is a snapshot of the volume of data that's come in over the last nine years. So we have 2011 to 2020 represented here. In the first column, you see impacts that were reported through the storm reporter tool. The next column are reports that were submitted that didn't have any impacts associated with them. So they document on the ground observations, um, but demonstrate during a storm where we're not seeing any impacts. The third column, the King Tide column, that's a tool that we added back in 2014 and started to gain a lot of momentum in the 2016 timeframe when we had some promotion in the Boston area. And then the final tool, this coastal resilience tool is related to monitoring nature-based shoreline management projects. And that one is mostly associated with projects that are funded through my office and the Coastal Resilience Grant Program. So in terms of the first column, the impacts that are being reported during coastal storms, I want to highlight that we had a lot of activity back in 2012 with Hurricane Sandy. So you can see that we had 571 reports submitted coastwide during that event. The following year, you guys might remember Nemo. Nemo got a lot of airtime uh, in the news and that event, we had the second most reports submitted in the system. Then our, our top year was 2018, you'll probably remember uh, the January 4th blizzard, but also the subsequent storms, three storms that we had in February as well. The state is still working with FEMA on disaster reimbursements for projects from that event. Focusing on Nantucket, 
from October of 2012 to February of 2021. I want to highlight that we have six individuals that have been actively involved with the MyCoast effort and reporting of coastal storm damages, but also high tide events. They've submitted 91 reports and 164 photographs to support um, our awareness of the level of impacts that are going on around the island. I just want to feature a snapshot of a report that was submitted back in January 3rd of 2014. You'll notice in the photographs that there's a veneer of flood water in these photographs <laughs> of the, the downtown roads. Um, by the Whaling Museum and the, the ferry and some of the other local businesses downtown. And interestingly, I went to the Nantucket Hazard Mitigation Plan and the description of the storm events actually lines up very nicely, not only with the National Weather Service description of minor coastal flood events, but of the observations that are being seen in the photographs and also checked off in the observations. So we had um, flooding of several roads down along the harbor, and there was a point where they were impassable because of the floodwaters and then also just the slush and other debris that was carried into the road during that storm. Oop. I don't know what just happened there. Hold on one second. There we go. So going back to the overview, I want to focus in on the weather and tide information that our system actually pulls from NOAA. Based on the timestamp of the report, we can actually get the snapshot of what was happening along the shoreline at the time of the observation. So we can see what the time was relative to high tide. We can see what the predicted tide was and what the observed tide was. And then in this situation, there was about two feet of surge. And bringing us back to the hydrograph that I started with, remember two feet of surge gets us within that minor action stage. So, Everything is lining up nicely in terms of the definitions and predictions from the National Weather Service and what's being seen on the grounds. So now we have an app that makes reporting easy. You don't need to photograph, go home and upload photographs and enter reports. You can do everything out on the shoreline, out in the field. And fortunately, we have apps both for Androids and iPhones. So I'm just gonna show you some screenshots of what it is to walk through the app. So this is the, the load page that just demonstrates that we have a number of tools that are available. And based on your GPS location, the app will automatically show you the tide stage and provide you the opportunity to get started with adding a report. Once you push the add a report button, you are provided with a menu of options of different types of reports you can submit. The very first one is the storm reporter. That's the reporting of coastal storm damage impacts. But as I mentioned, we have some other tools as well. So if you're out along the shoreline in non-storm conditions and you want to provide a photograph of um, a spring tide, we'd love to see those. We also you know, are looking for local partners that want to monitor any kind of nature-based shoreline restoration projects. And just recently, we've created a new beta tool to do um, beach profile monitoring as well. That's not something that we're actively promoting right now. We're still working out um, to make sure that we have all the right um, observations that we want in there, but you can play around with it 
if you'd like. Okay, so once you click on Storm Reporter, you're presented with these options. And at the top, we ask that you enter in the local name for the site that you're providing observations for. So Nantucket Harbor, for instance, is, is appropriate, or if you're at a particular beach, type in the beach name. And then from there, you have the option of taking a live photo and attaching it to the report. Or you also have the option, if you were to have taken a photo first, you can select a photo from your photo library on your phone. There's a lot of flexibility built into the tool. And then at the bottom, you will click Report Impacts, and then you'll get started with your options. So it's going to grab your photo date and time. If the time is off, you do have the option of adjusting that if you need to. And then the exciting part is reporting impacts. So if you have impacts to report, you just toggle that switch and then you'll see yes. And then these are the categories that we're looking for observations. We start with the infrastructure. We start with roads marinas and harbors, and then also buildings and any hazardous materials like oil and gas tanks that might be along a marina, for instance. And once you check those options, you'll get a drop down of the types of um, typical damages that you will see under those categories. And then in the right column here, you would actually have to scroll down on the app to see these. We are interested in if you can access the shoreline, if you're seeing beach or dune erosion, and also if there's any kind of emergency response and recovery efforts as well. So let's just toggle yes on the impacts to natural resources so you can see what the, the drop down menu looks like for one of these. Here we have a close up of the options for impacts to natural resources. As you can see here, these are the typical things you might experience when going down onto the beach. You might see that sand fencing has been thrown around or broken. If you're familiar enough with the site, you can determine if the beach has lowered, if the dune has been eroded back, if there's a coastal bank there, if that has been eroded. And then also, um, if material has actually overwashed the, the beach, the dune, and in some cases, if a channel has actually been cut through the beach or dune system. So these represent everything from minor to major impacts that would be seen within a beach system. So once you check off those options that are relevant, then you have the opportunity to provide other comments that don't fit within the checkboxes and set your location. Your location will be grabbed from the GPS on your phone. If you're not getting a strong signal for whatever reason, you always have the option of actually um, clicking on the pin and dragging it to a different location to refine it. You can zoom in and out, move it around to make sure that we've got the, the most accurate pinpoint on your photograph and the observations that you've checked off. And then finally, you hit submit, and then you become a member <laughs> of this esteemed group of individuals who are actively supporting efforts to understand the impacts on the ground from coastal storm events and, and high tides. So we currently have, as you see here, 392 people who have um, downloaded the MyCoast app in Massachusetts and who are either using it to monitor the tides. A lot of people like that, that tide chart that pops up when they load the app or to actually submit their photographs of high tides and storms. 
In order to access the online platform, if you're not comfortable with using an app on your smartphone, um, the address is mycoast.org forward slash MA. And if you visit the main landing page for MyCoast, you'll actually see that the effort that originated in Massachusetts has actually expanded out to a number of other states. We have states like Washington, South Carolina, um, New Jersey, all engaged in the MyCoast effort as well. And they're using it for coastal storm damage reporting, king tide reporting, but in some states, they're actually using the tool to monitor marine debris, asbestos on beaches. The platform is very flexible. So if there's interest in monitoring something else along the shoreline, the system can accommodate that. So that is um, my kind of uh, prepared lecture material and slides for this evening. So now um, we can move into Q&A if there are any questions. Gotta unmute myself. Um, there is one already in the Q and A. Um, the question uh, from Maya is, how does this all compare to what happened a hundred or more years ago? Well, the Nantucket tide gauge has been um, installed for since the the sixties, and we know that if you extrapolate that record out over 100 years that we've seen a rise we over of one foot over a 100 year period and in terms of moving forward we know that we could see an acceleration in sea level rise of two to six or more feet um, by the end of the century so what you need to think about is the hydrograph and right now it takes two feet of surge to get into that minor impact threshold. Well, you know, if we start to see one or two feet of sea level rise as our baseline, then two feet of surge on a two foot increase in sea level, that's gonna get us up into the, the moderate impact threshold. So we're gonna start to see more significant impacts moving forward. <laughs> Muted again. We have another question from Burton. Is the rate of global warming accelerated? And if so, is that causing higher than expected rising tides on Nantucket specifically? The acceleration in sea level has been documented and there are projections um, out through the end of the century that the state provides through the resilient mass um, climate tool. I can provide the, the link to you to distribute to everyone after the events. Sure, that would be great. Um, I actually have a question. Um, could you explain the king tide function, like what, what a king tide is exactly? Yeah, so you know how the tide fluctuates over the course of a month and over the course of the year? Well, when we have spring tides or tides that are associated with full or new moons, um, they're higher than average and they flood low-lying roads and impact parking lots and the king tide tool allows people to capture those higher flood stages from um, those spring tides and share those and the photographs can actually be used to depict what a future normal tide might look like in the future Oh, Burton said, thank you for answering his question. Sure. So is anyone going to download the app after the, the webinar wraps up? I know I will. I like things like this. I feel like citizen science is exciting. Um, I'll keep asking my questions because I have plenty too. Sure. Um, so is there any way uh, I'm thinking, okay, so I went to school in Florida and I remember learning about uh, mangroves and how that sort of vegetation helps prevent um, some coastal flooding. Is there something that we can do um, like that here on Nantucket? Do we just rely on infrastructure? Um, 
I mentioned that recently we added the coastal resilience tool to the My Coast effort. And when we're talking about coastal resilience efforts for the purposes of the tool, we're talking about nature-based shoreline management. So that's where you bring in additional sediment to provide some added elevation of a landform and buffering capacity to surge and waves, but also um, using vegetation as well to stabilize that sediment. Native vegetation is often um, really good at growing deep roots and extensive rhizome systems that can hold that uh, sand in place when a storm hits. So we often see, in addition to you know, beach nourishment projects and dune planting with dune grass, we're starting to see um, biodegradable materials like coconut fiber materials in the form of blankets and logs being used as temporary protection while um, native vegetation is planted to try and provide that natural stabilization. That makes sense. How long, um, I, I guess, okay, so I, I don't know a lot of the, I'm, I'm newly moved to Nantucket, so I don't know what all of the native coastal plants that you would plant um, to help boost your coastal resiliency, but what's the time frame on that? Because you're saying that it sounds like there's some temporary fixes and then like long-term uh, ideas would be vegetation, I'm guessing. Right, so um, dune grasses, for instance, they can get established pretty quickly if planted, um, you know, deeply so that they're secured in the sand. If we're working on a salt marsh, project, a fringing salt marsh to provide some um, buffering capacity and then also some habitat and water quality benefits. Some of those plants um, can take a year, a season or two to really get established and start to really spread and thrive. We are working on a number of fringing salt marsh projects through our coastal resilience grant program and we definitely need that secondary coconut fiber protection in the form of blankets and logs to hold the sand that we bring in in place while those roots get established and the plants start to expand across the site. We have a question from Matthew. Um, is there any formal or technical training regarding terminology and reporting? For example, is there a technical definition of erosion such that the reporting is not subjectively different between different reporters? We are interested in any threshold of sand loss. We, at the beginning of this effort, thought about providing thresholds like one to two feet of erosion, either vertical or horizontal and, and bins beyond that. But we found that that would really limit the number of people that would be able to meaningfully provide reports. You would really have to have very um, frequent and detailed site investigations in order to be able to provide that level. So we're just interested in action along the shoreline. Like if there's movement of the system, we want to know if it's happening. And um, so we hope that that doesn't discourage people from participating in the effort. You don't need any measurement tools to go out there. You just need to snap a photograph and give us those kind of like macro level observations of what's going on. We have other ways of getting more refined measurements. There's remote sensing, either through the form of aerial photographs or um, elevation measurements that will give us the more detailed snapshot of what's happening along the shoreline over time. Oh, there's a couple comments in here and they're not questions, but um, we have one from Robert saying, as a representative of the Preservation Institution of Nantucket, we will have our students using the tool in the future. Our last two summer studios have focused, or maybe it was supposed to be studies, have focused on coastal resilience for Nantucket. 
Um, and we have another comment saying, thanks, very informative. I'm in California, so unfortunately cannot be of much help with pictures or other reports about coastal flooding. Um, but you did mention that other states have been using it, right? I'm not aware that California is part of the system, but we can work on them. And I would love to have students participating in the effort. If you want a more um, specific training for the students, contact me at a later date and we can work something out. And I'm happy to be the bridge for that connection if anyone needs. Um, we have another question in the chat from William. Um, many of the coastal properties on Nantucket have large lawns, but are challenged to plant within wetland resource areas by state regulations and expensive CONCOM applications. Does the state provide any financial assistance to rehabilitate wetlands? So right now, the Coastal Resilience Grant Program through my office, the Office of Coastal Zone Management, is focused on doing um, shoreline restoration projects on public property. Unfortunately, based on um, the source of funding that we have for that grant program, we can't direct it to private properties but we can provide assistance in terms of determining the appropriate approach and the type of vegetation. We have a really nice um, landscaping guide on our website. I can also provide you the link to that to share with everyone. It will at least um, point you in the right direction. That sounds great. Um, I guess, well, I don't see an active question now. We can give it another minute or so. Thank you for answering so many questions. Sure, I, I prefer conversation. <laughs> yeah. Um, I guess I, I'll ask another question, give sure. everyone else a moment to think. Um, so beyond just the scientific aspect and like recording what's going on, um, are there specific actions that you take if you collect, an, like for instance, is there a reason beyond reporting in the moment? Like, do you, uh, you know, extrapolate something from this information and take a further action? Or is it just kind of recording as the climate changes, you know, storm surge and impacts? The data allows us to identify hotspot locations along the coast that are seeing frequent impacts from high tides and coastal storms. And we are able to look at the types of damages and get an idea of what management efforts need to be taken. So it can inform awareness as well as um, the management approaches. And you're absolutely right in terms of being able to identify much longer term trends, you know, as this system progresses over the next decade. Well, I think we've gone a minute or two without a question. So I think we've, I think we've probably hit everybody that has questions. Um, thank you again so much for taking the time to be with us this evening. It was such an informative talk and I'm excited to go home and download the app. Uh, so I'm looking forward see. to see how many new <laughs> users we get. <laughs> yes, that's very exciting. Well, um, thank you everyone else for, for joining us this evening. Um, once again, thank you to our sponsors, Bank of America, Cape Air, The White Elephant and Cisco Brewers. And you can catch us again next Wednesday, same time, same place, um, for another exciting Science Speaker Series talk. Um, so thank you again, and have a great night. You're welcome. Thanks for having me. Good night. Good night.